Welcome into this time of worship. As we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem and the events of that day that we find when we mesh the accounts from all four Gospels. If you wish to follow along with our worship today, the full liturgy and the readings for Holy Week are found on, in PDF form on either the From the Pastor blog on the Carnesville Moravian Church website or in a post on the church Facebook page. Join us as we enter into our time of worship today. joy. You heavens rejoice all the earth. The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Rejoice, rejoice greatly. Shout, shout for joy. joy. See, see your, your king, king is coming to you. you. He, he is righteous and brings and salvation. salvation. long ago that you would save us from our enemies, from the power of all those who hate us. You, you have shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and have remembered, remembered your holy covenant. With a solemn oath, to our ancestor Abraham, you promised to rescue us from our enemies and allow us to serve you without fear, so that we might be holy and righteous before you all the days of our life. By your tender mercy, you cause the bright dawn of salvation to rise on us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. 
the voice of the messenger echoes from the desert, calling us to prepare the way of the Lord and to make a straight path on which he may come. Let us confess our sins so that our crooked ways will be made straight and our rough ways smooth. Our sovereign Redeemer, we join the people of Jerusalem offering our own shouts of praise and celebration at your coming. Although we welcome you today with the multitude on Palm Sunday, we confess we have also stood with the condemning crowd on Good Friday. Our thoughts, words, and deeds have cried, Crucify! We turn to you for help and forgiveness, gracious Savior, not because we deserve it, but because you are forgiving. Save us from our sinful ways and restore us to a life of loyalty to you. Amen. Through John the Baptizer, we hear the Lord's promise, turn away from your sins and God will forgive your sins. Through the merit of Jesus Christ, strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Help us and all your children to respond to the call of your gospel with faith, love, and hope. God of faith, you created humanity to serve and praise you, and even when we rebelled against you, you promised to send a Savior to redeem us from our sins. Strengthen our faith in your, your saving work through Christ, Christ as, as you chose the people of Israel to hear the promise of redemption through the prophets. May people, people today believe in your good will for all that you have made. God of love, you fulfilled your promise of a redeemer in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Grant us the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we may share your love with the sick and the afflicted, with the poor and the homeless, with the victims of injustice and discrimination, and with all who are experiencing times of trouble. God of hope, you comfort us through our Savior's promise to return in glory at the end of time. As we await the coming of the Prince of Peace, let us not despair. We long for you to inspire all the nations and peoples of the world to turn to cooperation and nurture rather than to hatred and destruction. God of faith, love and hope to you and to you alone we pray. For you are our God, the only God, forever and ever. Amen.
you have kept the promise you made to our ancestors and have come to the help of your servant people. You remembered to show mercy to Abraham and Sarah and to all their descendants forever. We praise you, Lord. You are enthroned in glory, yet you came and continue to come for all who will receive you. We praise you, for you are good and your mercy endures forever. To, to you be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> We join in the readings that begin on page five of the readings for Holy Week, either in a hardbound personal copy or in the PDF of this book that's been made available through email or on the From the Pastor blog on the Kernersville Moravian Church website. Remember that we will omit certain hymns as we move through the text. Let us enter into the words of scripture, journeying with Christ the King. We come with rejoicing on our lips, praise in our hearts. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and were asking one another as they stood in the temple. What, what do, you, do think? you think? Surely he will not come to the festival, will he? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who knew where Jesus was should let them know so that they might arrest him. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave the dinner for him in the house of Simon the leper. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume, made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it, and the other disciples scolded Mary. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me, for you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her.
When the great crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. The next day, as Jesus and his disciples were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say, The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. The great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. As Jesus was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the the fowl of a donkey. And the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As Jesus came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another because you who did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him.
Then Jesus entered the temple, and the blind and the lame came to him, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They became angry and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read, Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself? Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all the people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of light. As it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie. In pastures green he leadeth me, the quiet waters by. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, the quiet waters by. My soul he doth restore again, and me to walk doth make. Within the paths of righteousness, e'en for his own name's sake. Within the paths of righteousness, e'en for his own name's sake.
what we see on Palm Sunday or any other day of this week really isn't the whole story. We come into these texts knowing what we know, unable to unknow it. So it is truly impossible for us to enter this week as the disciples did. Journeying with Jesus, knowing that their winds were changing, but not fully understanding everything this week and the months and years that followed it would bring. But each year we rehearse that story. What would it mean for you to consider how the uncertainty that we come into this Holy Week carrying might help us to understand and walk with the disciples this year? The disciples knew that this wasn't going to be just another Passover with Jesus in Jerusalem, but what unfolded couldn't have been farther from what they imagined. No matter which seat they were sitting in, really, we have lots of unknowns before us in this moment in our time. When will things return to normal? What will normal be or look like? When we do begin to return to it, what needs and challenges does this situation point out to us? How will we respond to them? How much of the brokenness of this situation and what it reveals be forgotten when we return to our normal? What should we carry with us from this moment into the future, forever changing our behaviors, forever changed by it. All those seem like the sort of questions that the disciples might have been pondering come nightfall on the Sabbath centuries ago. All of them are ones that we preachers often like to bring up as we enter into Holy Week each year, challenging all of us to be changed somehow as we move through the events of this week. But as we find ourselves tucked away in our own spaces, having our own upper room experiences of waiting and wondering what is yet to come, what might we learn this time around? What might we experience in a new understanding of our interconnected life? What might we learn about the way God treasures all our lives? What might it mean to live more fully as the beloved children of a doting and devoted creator? What we don't see yet at this point in the story of Jesus, what those first disciples cannot know yet, is what Easter and this week are all about. We know it. We've heard this story before. This is all about placing trust in God. Trusting in the unseen. But knowing this, how are we currently struggling with trusting in it during our own moments of uncertainty? This doesn't mean throw caution and precautionary actions to the wind during a viral pandemic because you trust in God. But it does mean, rather, than acting as though nothing is happening or feeling overwhelmed by fear in our current story, what might God be asking for us to awaken to in our understanding of each other and God's command that we care for one another? Too often we live lives that trust in the idea that our actions only impact ourselves. We are independent actors who can do as we wish without impacting the lives of lots of other people. But no matter how much we want this to be the case, we depend on each other. Our view of the storyline is just that, only our view. Rarely a big enough view to really get God's view of the story. This time has shown me just how much we depend on each other. When you start paying attention to every interaction, the grocery store, the pharmacy, the errands, the walks, the conversations that make up a day in our lives, 
you realize in this time of scaled back interactions, just how many most of us have in a day or a week. When you are mindful of every contact that you make or didn't make, you feel just how deep and rich of a web that supports your life. So I ask, how are we trusting in the unseen? How are we already trusting in the unseen? And how might we need to see some of what goes on unseen in our lives? What might happen by having our eyes open to some of what is too often overlooked or unseen? Could we just maybe be guided to a new and deeper trust and reliance on God and God's ways of being? Last year, I started the season of Lent off with a bit of a risky experiment. I bought two huge planters. The bags of soil needed to fill them, yes, three, count them, three bags of soil to fill the two pots that were this size. I bought peony, hosta, bleeding heart, oriental lily bulbs. And in church on that first Sunday of Lent, I rolled up the sleeves of my alb with the planters partially filled, ruler lines marking where each of the bulbs needed to be buried at depth. And I dug those holes and put those bulbs into the pots. At first, I set up a light and a timer system that I had used to start plants from seeds early in the growing season for a community garden plot that we used to keep. As the weeks passed, I needed more of the heat variation that those bulbs would have gotten outdoors. So I started hauling these planters back and forth every Sunday. Now the bleeding heart and the beginnings of the hostas started making some progress. They're in the other planter outside but there was something green happening in one of those planters, at least, by halfway through the Lenten season. But as we rolled into Holy Week, this other planter remained barren, with no obvious sign of activity or growth in it. On Monday, Thursday, the very first tip of something popped through the soil, showing just the top edge of its growing tip. And so on Easter, at least, we could celebrate that life in the midst of doubt and uncertainty had in fact burst through, even though most of us had already given up on it. Now that was a year ago. And on this Palm Sunday, that pot that last year had barely shown any sign of life in it looks like this. The peony that had never made any hint that it might do anything all of last year, never breaking through the soil, never showing any sign of life, is here. The ants already rimming its bud that's forming. The one that I was really looking forward to adding to my collection of peonies in the yard, well, it looks healthy and robust for a bulb that barely sent a green shoot out of that pot. But they took longer than expected. They needed to wait a little longer in the dark of the soil to be what God created them to be. Life around us in this moment offers us a pretty good glimpse of the range of uncertainty that is alive for the disciples in that week. They journeyed into Jerusalem alongside of Jesus. And with all the cheering and supportive people of the crowd. But they weren't ready yet to see what Jesus was asking them to become. They weren't ready until after they closed themselves off from life in the dark of the upper room. Until after a stone rolled away to reveal an empty tomb. And some of them found what they could never have imagined. 
that was God's story that they weren't yet ready for. What might this time, tucked away in the darkness of our own separate spaces, help us to learn about this story? And what might it awaken in us to take part in the story God is preparing for us to write next? How can we live these days in anticipation for the future? How can we greet these days with hope instead of grief? Alongside of this video for this Sunday's worship, I will be sharing a link for another short video piece by one of my favorite scholars on the Gospel of John, Caroline Lewis. In it, she reminds us that Easter is coming with all of the reversals that it ought to represent to us and to the ordinary ways that we can so easily go about life. I encourage you to take a few moments to follow the link and watch it through from beginning to end as our service today concludes. Let the same mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do unto others those things that will nurture God's will in them and for them. Listen to the word of the Lord, trust and believe. May you go in peace, assured of God's presence with you, with the mind of Christ as your path and your guide and the constant companionship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.